What up, bitches? Welcome back to Law of Attraction Changed My Life. I am your host, Francesca Amber. Did you have a nice Christmas? Did you have a calm Christmas? I hope so. Um, I'm back. I didn't go anywhere, but I'm back with a brand new episode. And today is something that I get very excited about. And that is my annual roundup of the best things that I have learned and implemented into my life that I have learned from the 12 self-development books I've read per year. What a catchy title. Do you think that'll be my title? <laughs> Probably not. Um, that is what we're doing today. So if you don't know, get to know. I host a self-development book club where we read a new self-development book every single month. I've been doing this for about three years now, three and a half years, and it's goddamn life-changing, okay? And the books that we do are not all strictly about the law of attraction or manifesting. They can be about all kinds of different shit, which is what you are going to see today. So today I've picked six of my favorite books from this year and just a couple of points from each one that have either changed my life, changed my mindset, and that I've actually implemented into my life and continue to use today, like all these months on. And so I wanted to share that with you. If you want to come and join the book club at any point, you can do so. I'll leave the link down below or you can find details at francescaamber.com. And the great news is if any of these books sound great to you, you can go back and listen to all of the episodes for that book. They are all there. You can go back in time and listen to any of these books. So let's get started. One of the best books that I read this year was Alan Carr. No, not that Alan Carr. You're thinking of the wrong one, but Alan Carr's Quit Emotional Eating. Now, this is the guy that got very, very famous for getting people to quit smoking. Like people that have been lifelong, 100 a day smokers, he could get them to quit in a fucking day. And he then used that method for all different kinds of addictions. He kind of worked out that all addictions were essentially the same root problem, whether it was uh, overeating or alcohol or smoking or drugs, whatever. It's all the same kind of shit. So, so we read this book about quitting emotional eating and it was what I really needed in my goddamn life. So this book had a transformational effect on me and so many of the book club bitches. It was the first time in my entire life that I felt like I'd got my eating under control and that I was enjoying like nourishing my body rather than trying to starve myself and feeling bad and then overeating and feeling bad. It was just a constant goddamn roller coaster. One of the things he taught us was that there are going to be good days and there are going to be bad days in our lives. Like we're not going to have a great day every day. And on those bad days in the past, I'd always been so tempted to just treat myself to like, like a takeaway in the evening. And it was for so many reasons. It was so many reasons. Number one, I find the job of raising three children by myself really hard. Some days I'm like run ragged by the end of the day and I have no energy and I feel like I need a pick me up. And number two was I am the only adult in my house. So it's not like when the children go to bed, I can like crack open a bottle of wine with a partner and be like, oh, let's lay and, you know, drink wine and watch TV and kiss each other's faces. I don't know what do couples do. I'm not sure anymore. Um, and I just felt like that was like the treat that I needed. But I discovered that once I started doing this book and I started nourishing myself better, that actually... I often would get to the end of the day and I didn't feel run ragged. I didn't feel like I needed a reward for just getting through the day because I had more energy. I had more enthusiasm for the day. I just was like more excited about life. The other thing we learned was that you don't have to stop life. So we had a bit of a controversial thing in the book where he was like, you don't ever need a birthday cake again. Like you don't need a birthday cake, but that doesn't mean that you can't have a birthday party. It doesn't mean that you can't go out with your friends and celebrate your birthday. You might just not want a birthday cake and that's absolutely fine. You can still attend birthday parties just because you don't want to eat junk food. You can still go out to dinner with your friends. Like you can still live your life. You can still go places. You can still do stuff. And the food element of it does not stop you enjoying the entire thing. Believe it or not, I mean, we've just got through Christmas. 
food actually is not a massive part of Christmas. That's not a massive part of the enjoyment of it. And I know if you haven't read this book, you're going to be listening to this being like, Fran, you're fucking crazy. And me listening to myself, I'm like, it sounds fucking crazy. But honestly, when you read the book, it almost brainwashes you. It is wild. Your body also, this is the other thing that I learned from this book that was absolutely life-changing. Your body doesn't gauge volume, but it gauges nutrients. So you know when you can eat like 10 packets of crisps and it could be quite a big volume or you could eat a load of like takeaway and then 10 minutes later you're hungry. Do you know why that is? It's because your stomach does not gauge, it doesn't measure volume of food, it only measures nutrients. This is why you literally cannot overeat avocados or fruit or I don't know anything that's good for you you literally can't because your body gets really full with the nutrients so quickly as soon as I learned this it was like something went ding 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 in my head and I was like fuck me never again will I overeat because as long as you fill yourself with the right foods you basically can never overeat and if you're filling yourself with shit you're just constantly being looking for more because you're going to be hungry now I know that as I talk about this, it's it sounds weird and it sounds like a cult and it sounds like it wouldn't work. But let me fucking tell you, this book works. The only thing I'm really annoyed about is that about two weeks after finishing this book, I lost my kitchen. And then about a month after that, I also lost my dining table and chairs. So I found myself with nowhere to eat food other than my new cream sofa and cream carpet in my sitting room with three children, which massively limited what we were able to really eat. Like it had to be stuff that didn't stain. It had to be stuff that wasn't like wet. And I tell you what, guys, I'm going to be real with you. It fucked me up. It fucked me up big time. Not having a kitchen. And we come on to this with some of the later books about how much your environment really, really affects your goals and how you live your life every day. And that really fucked me up. And so my intention is this period between Christmas and New Year and as we enter into January, I'm actually going to go back like the narcissist I am and listen to my own episodes on this book. (laughs) <laughs> because my episodes really inspired me the first time round, so I'm going to listen again. Um, I'm going to listen to my episodes on this book again, and I'm going to redo this book because it was such a game changer for me, and it was just such a shame that some old habits crept back because I didn't have a kitchen for so long. So fucking hell, bad timing, but quit emotional eating. Uh, it's actually not called that. It's called The Easy Way to Overcome Emotional Eating by Alan Carr. Top book, highly recommend it. I'll leave all the links down below. The second book that I really enjoyed in 2023 was Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before? Now, this is a book. Sorry, well, who's the author? Who's the author? It's Dr. Julie Smith. She is the lady that makes incredible mental health reels and TikToks that just explain things so easily. So this book was all about what people learn in therapy. And if you are therapy resistant like me, or if you can't afford therapy, which is a very real thing, I mean, 40 pounds for half an hour, that is not within everyone's reach. This book is a must have. So one of the best things that I learned from this book, and this is going to sound so simple, is that there are so many outside factors that contribute to a low mood. So how often is it that we get into a low mood, right? And we start to overthink it. We start to overanalyze why we're feeling so low. And we're like, I don't know. Is it because I hate my partner? Is it because I hate my life? Do I hate my job? Do I hate where I live? What's going on? Like you really start to overthink everything. I think, oh my God, is this it now? Like I'm in depression. But quite often there are just many outside factors that contribute to our low mood, which by the way, emotions and low moods are like the weather. They just come and go. Just don't overthink it. Now, a lot of these factors are really simple. It could be that you're really tired and you haven't had enough sleep. It could be that you are overworked and stressed. Maybe you're not eating right. You're not getting the right nutrients. It could be as simple as you're not hydrated. How often do we like dehydrate ourselves with 65% water, bitches? We've got to fucking hydrate. How often is it that you've seen your friends and had fun and relaxed? Are you working towards a meaningful goal? All of these things, right, are going to affect how our mood is. And it could just be a combination of a couple of these things, right? It could be that your house is cold. Maybe your heating isn't working. That'll get you in a low mood real quick. Maybe you're a little bit cold. 
the weather's bad outside, you're really overworked, you're tired, and you haven't seen your friends in a couple of weeks. That little combination of factors right there, that is enough to put you in what a lot of people would call a depressed mood. But actually, when you rectify some of these simple environmental triggers, your low mood disappears. So you don't need to worry that you're depressed and that you might need to go on anti-anxiety medication or change your whole life. It might just be really simple factors that are affecting you. And I can't tell you since reading this book how many times I felt really, really low. And then I just look at my period planner diary thing and I'm like, oh, I see my estrogen levels are really low today. I'm about to have a period. This is why I hate everyone. Or, oh, actually, when I think about it, I haven't seen any of my friends this week. I haven't made any time for me to enjoy myself. Or maybe I had no sleep last night. No sleep will fuck you up like a bitch. Let me tell you, as someone that has two toddlers that refuse to sleep through the night, it will fuck you up. So making sure that you have all of these simple outside factors figured out. The next thing I learned in this book that was incredible was about thought biases. And it's so simple again, but just that we all have the same thought biases in life. And two of them that really kind of uh, struck me was personalization, which is making it about you. And a classic example of this would be um, you are walking down the street and someone's walking the other way and you wave and say, oh, hello, and they don't wave back. And you instantly go, they fucking hate me they fucking hate me. Why do they hate me so much? Have they found my OnlyFans page? No, I'm joking. Um, Like you just make up all these things that are like, why does this person hate me? Why didn't they wave back? But actually that person could have been going through a really tough time. They could have just received really bad news that someone close to them has died or that their partner is cheating on them, that their partner wants a divorce, that their child is ill, whatever. I don't know. They could have received really bad news or be in a really bad headspace themselves. And so we instantly think, that it's us but actually quite often it's just people are living their goddamn lives the other one was catastrophizing and this is something that I did a lot when I was going through like a mental uh wait what's the word like 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 an emotional abuse situation is that you instantly jump to the worst case scenario so someone sends you a message saying something and you instantly think right that's it my life's over I'm gonna lose my job I'm gonna lose my house I'm gonna lose my children I'm gonna lose everything and you're gonna have to go and live like in fucking Ontario I don't know you instantly jump to the worst case scenario and you might replay that over and over in your mind and the only person that you are traumatizing is your goddamn self now There were many others. I think there were about six thought biases. But what I really got comfort from in this book was that this is such a common thing that so many people could relate to. And it just made me realize that my brain, I mean, essentially this book was about how your brain works and it was fucking amazing. Another great thing I learned was about metacognition, um, which I think I loved so much. I actually did an entire episode on this. And this is about getting some distance from your feelings. So rather than saying, I'm depressed. Instead, you could say, like, almost observe your thoughts, like take a step back, observe your thoughts and say, it's interesting that I seem to be having low thoughts today, or I seem to be experiencing a low mood. And it stops that low mood being you and being your entire identity. And instead, it just becoming, oh, this is something I'm experiencing right now. And that honestly has such a huge effect on the way that you feel and the way that you relate to the feelings that you experience. Exercise. This is one of the surprising things I learned in the book was the benefits of exercise. I mean, when we talk about exercise, hello, it's nearly January. We are all going to go and get a David Lloyd membership, aren't we? No, I'm fucking not. But we're all on that like new year, new me train. We're all like, yes, I'm going to be my fucking best self. But actually, when we think about exercise and we're like, oh, I'm just going to be so fit and a size 10 and whatever else, we only really think about the physical aspects. But what we learned in the book is what a powerful effect that exercise has on your brain. The side effects of exercise include happiness and motivation. Now, if you start to think of exercise as something that you do for your business, something that you do for yourself, your personal brand, your personal happiness, your relationships, rather than just something you do to try and fit into that dress you want to fit into, it becomes such a bigger thing. It becomes such a more important thing. So I really enjoyed learning about that. 
Okay, the next book is Hurt, Healing, Healed by Emma Mumford. And there was just one or two points in this that I really wanted to bring to your attention because they absolutely changed my mindset on a couple of things. So the first one is about blame and forgiveness. Again, I think I might have done a whole episode about this because it was such a game changer for me. But what she says in this book is that if you think of somebody that you have had a conflict or whatever with, somebody that you need to forgive, if you decide to forgive someone, by forgiving them, you are actually putting the blame on them and making yourself the victim. Instead, you need to just have absolute radical acceptance with absolutely no judgment for yourself or others about every situation. And this kind of goes along with what we've learned in other books about looking at everything through a lens of love. But this idea that actually forgiveness, which is something that so many people talk about as such a vital part of your self-development journey, actually is a little bit bullshit because while it's important to forgive people and not hold on to resentment, I think that's, you know, the, the, the gist there, The idea of forgiving someone, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? By forgiving someone, you're blaming them for something and making yourself the victim. And actually, when we look at any situation or story, it's so multifaceted. It's so, you know, there's 10 sides to every story. It's far, far better to just have radical acceptance and have no judgment. And Again, this is probably one of these things where you would probably have to read the book to fully understand this whole point and and to really implement it in your life. But let me tell you, when I've wanted to blame some people and when I've wanted to fucking forgive them, and let's be honest, half the time when you forgive them, you don't really forgive them. This has really helped me out. The other point from Emma's book was manifesting from alignment. Now, this one knocked me on the goddamn floor because When I read this, I realized that I had been manifesting from misalignment for so many years and with great success. So I realized as I was reading this part of the book, you know, why would anybody choose to raise their children alone, to live alone, to have mortgages on their own, to not share a property, to not share a car, to not share anything, to be financially independent, to not need anything from anyone why would anybody choose that? Now, I see a lot of messages from women all the time saying, I want to leave my partner and I can't and I don't have the financial support. I don't have the means. I don't have whatever. And I thank God that I'm not in that situation anymore. Like I understand and I'll never be angry at old version of Fran for creating this life for me. Like I will never be mad at her because let's let's be honest i did this out of protection i did this out of fear i did it to try and protect myself but when you look at manifesting from true alignment if i didn't have any fear if i didn't have any need to protect myself to such a high degree there's no way that i would have created a life like that for myself right it makes sense again you might have to like listen to the book club or listen to the whole book for it to make sense but when i heard about that manifesting from alignment I was like oh I've been manifesting from a place of fear I've been manifesting from a place of needing to protect me and my children I've been manifesting from this place and it's not actually been manifesting from true alignment it's a work in progress bitches I'm working on it let's see how it goes Of course, people manifest out of alignment in all kinds of different ways. You often see people that grew up poor and maybe were bullied for the clothes they had or whatever. As they get older, they get into debt over buying lots of designer things. This, again, is not manifesting from alignment. This is manifesting from a place of needing to prove something to others. So Hurt Healing Healed, full of fucking lessons. The next book, oh, this is one of my favorites. My next book was Style Therapy. Now, this was a 30 day experiment to dress for the life that you want. This is all about intentional dressing and I was fucking here for it. So I 100% was not dressing for how I wanted to be perceived or interacted with at all. And especially as a single lady, I wasn't going out into the world each day preparing to meet my fucking meet cute. Do you know what I mean? Like I was not preparing for that shit at all. What I learned from this is that for me, 
the ultimate act of mindfulness and the ultimate act of like being here, being in the power of now, for me, is dressing nicely and feeling your best. So I know that if I really want to enjoy a day and really make the most of it and be open to the opportunities that come my way that day rather than sort of shying away from them. I know that there's some things I need to do. I like to fake tan in the winter. I like to have a little Bondi Sands moment. I like to make sure that my hair is clean and either straightened or like um, or curled or whatever. And I like to wear clothes that I feel nice in. And I'm going to be real with you, okay? I'm a single mother of three. That ain't every day. That is not every goddamn day. There are days when I wake up and I literally get those kids off to school and nursery and I am sat hunched in my office in whatever clothes I found on the floor. And that's fine. It's not going to happen seven days out of seven. But for me, what happened with that book is I went from dressing like a troglodyte six to seven days out of seven and only looking good on rare occasions to actually consciously deciding to dress nicely and present as my best self and dress for the life that I wanted about three to four days a week, which look, it's a goddamn improvement, okay? It is an improvement for me. So that was my first lesson from that book. Since I've been on this self-development journey, I, like I said, I've been reading self-development books once a month for about three and a half years now. I am more confident than ever in myself in terms of who I am as a person, like my morals, my values, my knowledge, um, my work ethic, what I represent as a person. You know, I live in alignment with my values a lot of the time. I stand up for what I believe in. I treat my children how I believe they should be. Do you know, does that make sense? Like I, I feel a very, I feel very confident in those terms. What I represent as a person, everything to do with like the mental side of me, I feel more and more confident in myself than I ever have before. But this physical side was like the final frontier for me. So like my physical self, my physical body, how I present, how I dress, like this was not matching up to how I felt inside. And you know what? I'm fucking thankful because there's a lot of people that look good on the outside and they're trash on the inside. Sorry, but it's true. Um, And I'm really thankful that I feel the opposite. Like I feel like my outside doesn't match to the work I've been doing inside. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? But you can't see your inner beauty on goddamn Tinder, okay? So girls got to work. Okay, the next book that I absolutely loved, is this the final book? Oh no, is Fuck You Chaos. Now I loved doing this book and I would urge you to buy it if you can because it is a self-published book. Yes, we love a self-published queen by our very own book club bitch, Dominica. So this book is actually one of the best books I've ever fucking read. I'm putting it up there with one of the best books I've ever read. There is something very magical about decluttering. When it comes to manifesting, when it comes to achieving your goals, when it comes to making space for shit in your life, there is something very magical about decluttering and decluttering your home, your mindset and your finances all at once, which is what this book does. It's a fucking magical trifecta, okay? So decluttering simply makes space for what you actually want to bring into your life it simplifies, it frees up your mental bandwidth, it frees up your energy, it frees up your space, it frees up your time, it frees up so much shit in your life. And I think that's our number one problem, isn't it, is that we always say we're too busy, we're overwhelmed, we're stressed out. We often are overwhelmed and stressed out by the stuff around us. Even if you're not aware of it, you are overwhelmed by the stuff around you. And so getting rid of anything that is not in alignment with yourself or your future self really makes space to intentionally bring in the shit that you want. Now, when we intentionally or energetically declutter with a goal in mind too, oh boy, that is even more powerful. And this is something that I need to do more. Like I sometimes think, oh God, I don't know if I want anyone to live in my house with me. Like I don't know if I could ever meet a man and want him to live with me. Like where would his stuff go? And it's ridiculous because I live in a master suite that has a his and hers fucking wardrobe. Like there is literally no excuse. And I do need to energetically declutter half of my wardrobe and leave space for him with like matching hangers and shit. I know I need to do it. I know I need to do it. Now, When we did this book, some amazing things happened to me. 
something that happened and there were many things but was that the less toys me and the girls had not me and the girls I don't have any toys but like less toys that the girls had the more we played together so look I've been poor and, I, and I've lived in a very small space with not very much and I've been richer and had a lot of space and a lot of toys let me tell you I've done both okay and it, it, I, I can see the benefits of both so when I used to live in a little one bedroom flat with my daughter, I just got divorced, me and her moved back to London and I had to Airbnb my flat every other weekend. And so we couldn't have like toys everywhere because everything had to look like a fucking showroom, like a hotel room every other weekend. So she had one basket of toys. I'm not exaggerating when I said we had one coloring book and one set of paints and two paintbrushes, and we would sit and paint together. Now, when I lived there with Bo, some things were very, very hard. Some things were difficult. My sister bought her a doll's house for Christmas. We couldn't have it in the flat because there wasn't room for it. There was nowhere that I could hide it when we had Airbnb. Um, but some things were better. So everything got turned into a game. We would cook dinner together. We would make pizza together. She would help me chop vegetables. We would clean together. We would do yoga together on the TV. We would sit and play with her very minimal toys together. We would get those two paintbrushes out and we would paint together every night with this one colouring book. And now I look back on it, it was like a beautiful time. It was a beautiful time. And now I'm in the situation where I live in a much, much, much bigger house with a lot more children, three children now. And I'm so lucky that I can get them whatever they want. You know, since we've moved here, I'm like, you've got your own playroom, bitches. Guess what? Woo! Like Bo's got a hamster. They got a trampoline. I got a fucking swim spa pool for them. Like I got them so much stuff because I just oh, got a bouncy castle. Like this is how ridiculous it gets. Got a fucking bouncy castle. And some of these things when you use them with intention, really do add to your home life and they do make life easier. I'm not saying they don't at all. Um, but if you find yourself cluttered with toys, I think you'll find more of your time is spent telling your children to tidy up after themselves, being stressed out about having to put things away than actually playing. And during this period, we got rid of a lot of toys. I donated so much to my local church and we found ourselves playing together far more than we ever did before. We did more crafts together. We did painting. We did activities together. And it was beautiful. So I'm not saying that you need to go and live in a one bedroom flat and have no toys again. Like that's not what I'm saying. But there's definitely a beautiful balance to be found between the two. A clutter free environment really is the basis for like all good things in our lives. It gives us a calm, clear space to live out our lives, to eat healthily as a family, to play games, to make memories together, to have people over, to have parties and to enjoy doing what we love. So one of the things in this book was to create intentional spaces and when you create an intentional space within your home, you are setting an intention for what you want that area of your home to bring to your life. So I made my office very inspirational, like I colour coded all of my bookcases and I put up artwork that was like, it just made me feel like I was in like a Dalston loft, like I just really enjoyed it. And um, my bedroom, I turned that into a space just for me. After so many years of not having my own bedroom, it was so important for me to have a space for like self-care and a space that was just dedicated to me. My guest room had never been used when I read this book. It was like, it didn't even have a bed. It had nothing in it. It just had like stuff. And so I turned that guest room into a really inviting place for friends and family to come and stay. And after doing this book, I actually invited a couple of friends to come and stay. And I think ever since we've done this book, at least once a month, I have people come and stay in my guest room. And I really enjoy leaving them like little miniature toiletries. And I bought a, um, a really nice bathrobe from like the Waldorf Astoria and I put that in there for them like I'm trying to make it bougie for these bitches do you know what I mean like I'm trying to make it nice and so the intention for that guest room is I want more friends and family to visit me and feel like you know my home is their home um my playroom I 
my intention for that was that we would play together more, that we would do more crafts together. The kitchen, this was a space to create healthy food and to enjoy meal times together as a family. And there's so many things that you can do in that kitchen or whatever space we're talking about to foster that environment for the experiences that you want to have in that space. So this book, I cannot recommend it enough. Again, it's called Fuck You Chaos. I'll leave all the links down below. You're going to fucking love it. And the final book of the year that I absolutely loved, of course, is the most recent book that we've done called Calm Christmas and a Happy New Year by the amazing Beth Kempton. Now, this book I just thought would be like a fun festive read for Christmas, right? It was like so of the moment. It was so of the season. But it actually changed my goddamn life. So I think this Christmas that's just gone is potentially one of the best Christmases I've ever had. And I 100% put that down to Beth Kempton. And when I say Christmas, I don't just mean Christmas Day, but I mean that whole festive period that for me definitely starts about the beginning of November. Now, in the past, I've always left presents to the last minute, really panicked, panic bore. I'd leave my wrapping until like one of the last nights in December. I'd be up late. I'd be panicking. It would be awful. Now, Combine this with the fact that the end of December is also my busiest work time of the year. So, you know, New Year goal setting. Everyone wants to set goals on New Year and New Year, New Me. That is like my fucking busy time. And so December's for me were often rushed, stressed. I couldn't fully enjoy it. Remember what we were talking about earlier where for me to really enjoy certain things, I have to feel rested for it. I have to have like my hair looking nice and like do my tan and do my makeup and I want to feel nice in myself. Well, I never did any of that because I just didn't have the time. Like I just felt super rushed. Not this year, my friends, not this year. I have never had such a calm Christmas. So when we planned out our festive period, I looked at it and I was like, what is really important for me in the Christmas period? And you do like this constellation of your Christmas. And for everyone, different aspects of Christmas mean different things that have different importance. So for some people, the religious aspect is like really, really important. For other people, seeing family is really important. One of the things that I find really important is it's a time of year to connect with friends and to go out and to enjoy yourself. So I had plans for every weekend in December. Now, I did go a bit hard. I went out so much. It took me a full working week to get over each night out and I actually thought I had lupus. But despite that, I still lived my best goddamn life. (laughs) So I went out on all these nights and I was ready for them as well. Like I was prepared. I was rested. I'd done my hair like I felt great. And so I knew December was going to be a busy month, not only with these nights out, but of course, all of the festivities with the children. And so I made a decision as I started reading this book, like mid-November, I want to buy and wrap 99% of my presents by the 1st of December. And guess what? Spoiler alert, that's exactly what I did. I was so on top of shit. I would bought people amazing presents. I'm just saying, I think I did. I had wrapped them all. I was goddamn prepared. And that left me with so much more energy to actually enjoy December, to actually enjoy the fruits of the labor. You know, we raise children all year and then Christmas is such a magical time. You don't want to be stressed out and rushing around and not enjoy it. One of the most magical things happened to me, and this isn't going to sound that magical, but I just relaxed and enjoyed Christmas in really small ways. So in the past, I always felt like I had to like go out and do everything, do every Christmas activity, go and see the lights here and go and do that. And I didn't do that this year. We did really kind of like slow living, enjoyable things. I sat at my kitchen table and I made a gingerbread house with my two youngest daughters one wintry afternoon with Christmas music on in the background. I made all of my daughters hot chocolates and we made little Christmassy hot chocolates and they all put different sprinkles on one evening. We sat and watched The Grinch together at least nine times, I'm going to say. And I'll tell you what was the biggest win for me. And this is going to sound so weird, but I'm proper into like yoga at the moment. I'm really like, I'm balls deep into it. I'm balls deep into like wintering well, Christmasing well, winter wellness, all of it. All of it. I fucking love it. And what I did for myself this winter, this Christmas, is that I have been sitting in my sitting room when the children have gone to bed. 
with a hot chocolate, with my Christmas lights twinkling, with little candle light on and watching Christmas movies. And it has been absolutely glorious. It has been nourishing for my soul. I've watched The Holiday. I've watched Elf. I've watched Single All The Way. I've watched Holiday. I've watched them all. If they're on Netflix, I've watched them. And I have really enjoyed my goddamn self, okay? So I feel like this has been one of the best festive periods I've ever, ever had. And that is 100% down to Beth Kempton and Calm Christmas. Just simply deciding to create the Christmas that you want, to be intentional about how you want to spend your time and energy and therefore making it happen. How many of us just go along with whatever we've done every other year because that's what we've always done and that's what, you know, that's tradition. You don't have to do that. You can say no to things that bring you anxiety and make you sad or make you stressed out. And you can say yes to the things that bring you more joy. You just have to think about it and put your intention there and plan it a little bit. And so for that reason, that was one of my favorite books of the year. So that's it. That is the roundup of my 2023 uh, best books in the book club. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Like I said, I'll leave all the links down below. And if you want to come and join the book club and listen to any of these books, you can do at any moment. It is not too late for you. Um, Remember on Saturday the 30th. So, oh my God, is that tomorrow? It's tomorrow. If you're listening to this on Friday when this comes out, it's tomorrow, bitches, okay? Um, You can come and join me for my 2024 goal setting party. This is my third year doing it. My third year in a row. I can't believe it. And this process of reflecting on my year and setting goals for the year ahead has been absolutely transformative. It has been absolutely integral to, you know, like we were just saying about being intentional and planning your Christmas, right? Like your Christmas does actually make up about six to eight weeks of your year. That's two months of your year. It's a big chunk of time to get right or to get wrong. It's the same with your whole year planning. You can set goals and be intentional about how you want to spend your year, what you want to do, where you want to be, how you want to feel. And I tell you, if you do this every year, it will completely change the trajectory of your goddamn life. So if you want to come and join me, it's at 8 p.m. on the 30th of December, UK time. And it is a Facebook live video. Um, When you buy a ticket, you will be given a password and an order number to get into the Facebook group. And then we will be live there at 8 p.m. on the Saturday night. If you can't make it live because you're in a different time zone or you might just be out, you might have a life, who knows? Um, You can watch it afterwards. Like there's there's no time limit on it. You can watch it. And in fact, there's a lot of people that prefer to do this sort of stuff later on in January. So if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to do it in the first week of January or at the end of January, you can do it whatever goddamn time you like. Don't let anybody else tell you what to do and how to live your life. Um, but I'll leave link for that down below as well. Or you can just go to francescaamber.com. Anyway, that is the end of this episode. And this is my final episode for this year. I'll see you in 2024. The law of attraction has changed my life. It's going to change yours too, bitch. Bye.